Uh, we're joined now by the Home Secretary, Priti Patel. Uh, good morning, Home Secretary. Tom, good morning. Thank you very much for joining us. Let's, of course, talk about David Amos. You've called David Amos a dear, dear friend of yours, and, of course, he was a fellow Essex MP that you've known for many, many years. You looked visibly upset yesterday when you visited the scene in South End. May I ask, what is your fondest memory of David? I've got so many just really fun memories, actually, Tom, of, of David, because um, I, I knew him. I've known him for nearly 30 years. So we've we've kind of like, you know, been at the grassroots of politics together for a long time. He had a personality which was just so extraordinary, infectious, energetic, um, which really summed him up. And he was always there to, you know, really keep people grounded but also remind people of some of the best anecdotes in political life and, you know, some really, really good things that had happened locally. And, you know, when you're having a difficult time, he would really just sort of, mm. you know, give you give you that uplift that you, that you need sometimes. But I tell you, the, the really big memory that will live with me forever, um, and I was actually sharing this with my husband yesterday, is David's ability to bring people together um, I have been in, uh, to, to so many events with David where he would literally take your hand and put it in the hand of somebody else to uh, make an introduction and connect people. He was just so warm, kind, generous, and he knew how to bring people together. And that that will really sum up David to me, actually. It really will, because he was just he he was a big hearted man that loved people. He was a man of the people in that sense. He really was. Well, that's a, that's a lovely image, a lovely binding image. Now, look, I, I understand you can't say anything would prejudice a, a live murder investigation because that's what's going on right now, especially not as Home Secretary. But you also understand, people understand, have a huge amount of questions about what happened on Friday. Mm. So, look, may I ask first, have the police told you why they've designated his killing a terrorist incident? Well, the answer to that is, of course, yes. So, um, Tom, I can't talk in any aspects around the police inside and the background um, I don't want to comment on speculation in newspapers either. But as you would it rightly expect, and the public should take confidence from this, I do clearly know um, details as to why it's been designated a CT, why the investigation is being led by counterterrorism policing. Um, I have literally spent since Friday, as you, you would expect, um, much time with the intelligence agencies, with CT policing, with my friends and colleagues in Essex police as well. This is um, a big investigation, rightly so. Um, obviously, the attack was absolutely appalling. But at the same time, you know, we have the best intelligence and security services in the world. They are looking at everything. And that is absolutely right and proper. Uh, that, that I understand. I mean, look, the obvious question I think is really troubling everyone, troubling a lot of MPs as well, is why David Amos himself was specifically targeted. You and I have just discussed, he was one of the nicest MPs there is, a, a kind man who never said anything nasty about anybody. I've been covering politics for uh, almost longer than you've been in it, and I can't ever remember him saying a nasty word about anybody or anything. So do we have any idea why him? So I can't discuss any of that. I really can't, Tom, um, and I, I don't want to get into that. But you've, you've touched on a wider point, which is obviously about members of parliament, their safety, security, concerns, all of those, and rightly so, rightly, you know, very, very um, big issues. We are elected representatives. Our roles are very public. Um, you, you know my views. I, I believe that we, we absolutely continue. We live in a democracy. We put ourselves out there. Um, there is a lot of work taking place. Let me just give that guarantee and assurance, um, not just from Friday onwards. There's been a lot of work, actually, um, that takes place every single day with MPs and policing. Um, and that is through something called Op Bridger, which was a direct response following the really just horrific murder of Joe Cox. Mm -hmm. Operation Bridger was a direct response around police local MPs, direct engagement, looking at risks, proportionate measures, risk assessments, etc., protective measures. Um, and this weekend, uh, on Friday afternoon, every single MP um, was contacted or had the opportunity to be contacted by 
their local police in to run through their own risk assessments, their plans for the weekend, next weekend, what they're doing, um, and to put measures in place. And it's right that we do that. And there is more to come in this space as well, because the Speaker and I are working together. Um, the police will be in Parliament, literally doing holding sessions for MPs as well on a one-to-one -one basis. And it's right that we do all of that right now so that we can absolutely give the MPs the confidence that they and their families and their constituents um, rightly want to have so that they can go about conducting their business in the usual way. Understood. And we'll be speaking to the Speaker at St Lizzie Hall a little bit later. But are you concerned right now, this weekend, of potential copycat attacks on other MPs uh, after Sir David Amos's death on Friday? Well, I'm concerned all the time, Tom. I mean, it's my responsibility to be concerned um, when it comes to public safety, threats to the public, threats to MPs. That's ongoing. It's, it's not just today. It is absolutely ongoing. And as I've said, we have the best security and intelligence agencies in the world. Believe you me, um, I can't sit here and share, you know, the tradecraft and the work that they're doing. Um, they are constantly, every single minute of the day, looking at risk, looking at threat, making assessments, sharing that with the people that need to be engaged, including myself and our Prime Minister, um, and making sure that across our entire system, um, and I'm sorry that's a terrible word to use, but there's an integrated system, policing, mm -hmm. locally, CT policing, intelligence agencies, parliamentary authorities, you know, across the streets of our country, that there is an integrated response um, should something materialise. OK, look, I know you can't talk about the investigation. I know you can't talk about the suspect as well. You're well aware there's an allegation reported widely this morning that the suspect was asked to attend the PREVENT programme, which is obviously the, the counter-radicalisation programme the government's been running for yeah. a long time. Now, without talking about the specifics in that, can you say what the practice is if someone, not this suspect, but someone else, goes to a PREVENT programme, goes through that counter-radicalisation, do they then drop off the system forevermore or do they continue no. to be watched? No, there's no such thing as dropping off the system forevermore. Um, so first of all, the prevent program um, is actually going through an independent review right now for good reasons. Um, you know, it's right that we review what works, what doesn't work, what needs bolstering, if there are any gaps, all of, all of that. Because prevent isn't just about policing. Prevent is, and the channel program is also about how multi-agency partners come together. So I can tell you now that there are people that have been referred to programs that do not necessarily end up on de-radicalization -rad programs because mm -hmm. they're chaired by local authority, multi-agency partners. And I think um, for the year 2019-2020, um, the, these figures might not be specific um, to, the, to but around 20% plus were referred to other agencies. So, for example, mm. social services, education, mental health, um, and not to CT or intelligence or to policing. Um, others that are put on referrals, you know, m much more wide-scale referrals. But then there are those that will go through um, de-radicalization programs and radicalization programs, and it's right that they do so. And prevent is important. It is right mm. that the government does everything possible um, and looks at every tool, every program, every enhancement, working across agencies to ensure that we can de-radicalise people. But yeah. as I said, I mean, prevent is going through a review right now um, because I always believe that we must learn lessons, we must do more. Um, and, you know, we, we may need to change techniques as well um, and well, put more that, tools in place. On that Home Secretary... You'll also be aware that three terrorists in the last few years have been referred to prevent and then have gone on to commit acts of terror, including, uh, on one instance, the murder of three people. Prevent is being reviewed. You, you've said that. and I know you're, you're looking at that very closely. But it's reasonably clear now, isn't it, that it is failing in its current form? Um, I wouldn't say that. It is being reviewed. It's being investigated. You've mentioned um, individuals, perpetrators that have gone on to commit acts of terror. I should also say it's not just about prevent, it's actually about some of the laws that we have in place as well. So in the last 12 months, we've changed our laws around um, terrorism, we've had the counterterrorism and sentencing, 
Act now in Parliament, um, higher thresholds and penalties and sanctions um, for people that are involved in attack and terror planning. Um, there is so much more work that takes place in the CT space. We have a counterterrorism operations centre, which for the first time actually works with prisons and probation. Um, all of these are new tools, new ways of working, integrated ways of working. Mm. But actually, we, we have developed over the last 12, 12 months, um, I've led much of the work on CTOC, but also the counter-terrorism and sentencing, Bill As It Was Now Act, um, increasing the sentences of individuals that actually have been in prison um, and obviously then gone on to commit terrorist acts um, and developed mindsets as well. We have to recognise, Tom, that there's no, there is no one-size-fits-all. We live in a complex world when it comes to CT. Um, lone actors, for example, not just on the Islamist side, but also on the extreme right side as well. Threats materialise in different ways. People become radicalised in different ways. It's not all on online anymore as well. Um, through um, different tools, different means and measures, which is why coming back to prevent, it is absolutely right that we have the review. The review is taking place. Um, we have to do everything that we can to make sure that we can de-radicalise, but also um, at the earliest possible point of intervention, mm. identify individuals who are on the cusp of becoming radicalised to stop them from committing crimes and harm across our society. No, I'd say, um, just the, the most important point of this, I suppose, I know it's a difficult question to ask you, you now we're only 48 hours on after all from this incident are you now 100 percent satisfied can you say you're satisfied that the state and all its arms that you've been talking about could not have done more to protect david amos well look there is an ongoing uh, there's a live investigation so i can't you know i can't i don't want to speculate basically what more could have been done or anything of that nature but what i would say about mps and you know Dear David, as well, going around doing his surgery, you know, normal Friday business. There are there are protective measures in place for members of parliament. So mm. we I meant more of on the prevent program. I, what what, what I, was? Well, well, on on prevent and the wider work. I mean, clearly around the around. I, I don't want to talk about the perpetrator, the individual. I, you know, we I can't get it. I don't can't get drawn into that because we will we will find out in due course. But I, I do not want to leave your listeners with the impression that, you know, MPs are not provided with safety and security. They are. There are things that will clearly change going forward. When it comes to prevent and knowing about known individuals, it's important your listeners, and I, I'm sure they do understand and they will know this, we have the best agencies in the world. They act upon information yeah. around individuals. And that's, that's so important. That is so, so important um, that we know who's out there and that where we have programmes, that we link them up to programmes, we put them on programmes. You have a duty, quite frankly, and a responsibility around de-radicalisation um, while also making sure that people go on programmes that they're known to the authorities so they, that they can't, mm. can't harm people, can't, can't harm the public. Let's move on to wider politics then, because this horrific incident has also opened quite a lot of doors, quite a lot of questions about you know, how our discourse happens. There is a suggestion that this suspect was radicalised online during lockdown. I know you don't want to talk about him specifically either, but that does yeah. rather point the finger wider at what is still available on the internet. Tech companies are still allowing very dangerous material to be published on their servers, are they not? Well, first of all, um, I, I, I don't want to be making any assumptions around the individual on, on, and online. I, I just want to say that. In terms of dangerous material, um, the CSPs, tech companies, as you've referred to them, um, I'm very vocal about end-to-end -end encryption. And I am for a reason. I think these companies should be held to account. I think they should be working with mm. law enforcement and the authorities. We're going to change our laws around this through the online harms bill, um, the component of the bill that actually sits with me because it is actually with DCMS. But irrespective of that, we will put in fines, sanctions against tech companies that do not cooperate because they cannot, they cannot hide behind this facade of encryption saying that it's a breach of privacy while at the same time, there will be children, Tom, that will be subject to abuse, child abuse. And I've spoken about this too many times. I'm afraid I've spent too much time with survivors and I've heard their, their harrowing testimony. But also in the terrorist space, when you go back to 
not that long ago, actually, Christchurch, what happened in Christchurch, mm. um, live streaming, for example, of that atrocity there. Um, we now have good cooperation, actually, with some aspects of the technology system and companies. Um, and there are good forums, um, Internet Technology Forum, GIFCT. Yeah. On that point, great... <clears throat> on that, sorry to interrupt, but on that point of encryption, it's quite possible, and we don't know, you might know, but I won't, and I won't ask you, but it is quite possible that right now, the current investigation that the police are doing in South End could be being hampered by encrypted messaging that the social media companies are just refusing to unlock. Well, you've said that. I'm not going to get drawn into that speculation and comment. But encryption, as I've said, I'm speaking in the broadest terms, as you'll appreciate, as to why, Tom. Encryption cannot, you know, we cannot, tech companies cannot carry on, as I've said, just hiding behind this sort of, you know, facade of privacy, individual privacy when it comes to some of the highest harms, counterterrorism, radicalization, um, online child sexual abuse that takes place and it is taking place and we know it's taking place. Mm. Same around the dark web and those types of aspects. There is a lot of work, a lot of work, and I do want mm. to reassure your listeners, some really impressive work, I have to say, by our agencies, National Crime Agency, our intelligence agencies. I can tell you now, they're leaving no stone unturned. They go after the perpetrators of these crimes and they will continue to do that. My message to the tech companies, to the likes of Facebook and everyone else involved with those big firms, work with us and be part of the solution. They cannot hide behind privacy. They really can't anymore. Let me just ask you one more question. That Sonny wants to have a quick question with you too. On the subject of online abuse of MPs, I mean, we're all aware of it. When he was vaccines minister, the Nadim Zahari's Twitter feed was full of people telling him they knew where he was and they're coming for him, the anti-vaxxers. Tulip Sadiq uh, is quoted in the Sunday Times this morning. She gets abused daily, but violent threats to rape her or butcher her family once every three weeks. You've had abuse online. People have been jailed for abusing you online and, and you're the Home Secretary. Simple question. How is this level of online abuse towards MPs that is incredibly corrosive still legal? Um, it shouldn't be, actually, for a start. And I, I, I am very vocal about this, Tom. I mean, I've, I've seen it for a long time. I am one of the most trolled politicians out there. And, you know, when I finish doing this, I'm sure there'll be a lot of other abuse. It's not acceptable. And this comes back to people that, uh, you know, anonymity, all the rest of it is just not acceptable. But can I, can I just say, say something else as well? Because I appreciate we're focused on MPs and it is all wrong and it's right that MPs report to the police. I absolutely do believe, and I encourage this constantly, I want colleagues to report anything that's hate, you know, hateful, corrosive, threatening, intimidatory harassment to the police. And the police are there to absolutely take action, and they will. I've seen that. Colleagues have seen that. There are many MPs, and I can't get drawn into some of the cases. There's some live, live investigations already in this space as well. We must do that. But actually, actually, there is something else here. It's not just MPs. There are kids. There are children, Tom, kids the same age as our own children, that are experiencing so much abuse online. And that is absolutely unacceptable. And I genuinely believe that as a society, there is work that we're doing, obviously, in government, through legislation, online harms, etc., that will seek to address this. But actually, in terms of wider discourse in society, we have to, this has to stop. There are kids that have committed suicide through bullying, through social media, through harassment, through all sorts of things. And that is why I come back to the social media companies, the tech companies, take stuff down. I've had to... I have had to get into very serious conversations with tech companies over um, racial hatred, anti-Semitism online, and it takes hours and days to pull this stuff down. That is not acceptable, which is why I will continue to be unrelenting in my challenge back to these firms. Hello, Home Secretary. It's Sonia here. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, you get a lot of abuse online. How does that affect you personally? Well... There, there are a couple of points that I'd make about this. Um, I think the, the perpetrators of abuse want it to just absolutely eat away at you so that basically you give up and you stop standing up for, you know, some of the things that we feel strongly about some, and the work that I do. And I, and I won't let that happen. I won't let that happen. 
but it is awful. It is absolutely appalling. Um, and I, my colleagues speak to me about this a lot because they are affected by it. And, you know, that's, that's why I, I try and support my colleagues where I can on this too, because we can't let these perpetrators win by trying to grind us down. And it's just not acceptable, Sonia. It I'm really isn't. And, and it's should, not just us. And it's not just us, I should add. And should it is pe- our families in particular yeah. and also our children. And should people who abuse people online be be able to hide behind a cloak of anonymity or should social media companies be putting a stop to that? So I I on the abuse side, I just I mean it's the anonymity which obviously gives people, I think, or feel people gives these individuals I think obviously the ability to act in the way in which they do um I would like to and I have said this many many times directly I do think when it comes to hate harassment um abuse quite frankly and cruelty I would sum this up as absolute cruelty that is put out online the tech companies should absolutely share that with the police and do much more to expose it there is a space, however, though, we have to be proportionate around some aspects of anonymity. And I say this also as a politician that has done a lot to do my work with BNOs Hong Kong to support individuals who are pro-democracy rights and movements that can't put their names out in the public domain. But that is totally different to the cruelty, the absolute cruelty that various individuals are you know, putting out online. It is Cruelty is probably the strongest word that I would use to um, sum up how, how what they are doing basically to other human beings, not just politicians, but to we are human beings to other human beings more broadly. Home Secretary, we have to let you go. Final question as an Essex MP. David Amos campaigned for 20 years to get South End city status. Do you think the best tribute that the nation could possibly do to him now is to, to recognise South End as a city? Tom, if you could see me now, I'm smiling at that suggestion because David was just, you know, I've, I've said this so many times, a wonderful advocate. Um, people will decide about that, but clearly, and it, I, I've said this already this morning, I think one of the one, last Prime Minister's questions that he put forward, he was speaking exactly about that. Um, it it's would got your be vote. A, it would be a wonderful tribute to our, our, you know, my dear friend David. 